Sora, a typical high school boy, is watching a video on his phone when his classmate Mimi walks in and greets him. After asking about their classmate Yamaku, she drops her bag and occupies the seat in front of him. They start to talk about Dead Man Wonderland, a prison that they're going to visit for a school trip, which also doubles as an amusement park. As they reminisce about the old Tokyo, Yamaku walks in and scolds Sora for leaving him behind while eating his last piece of breakfast. The trio then looks forward to their school trip before they study for their exams. As the bell rings, the students settle into their seats when Sora feels a presence outside. He then sees a man floating with a red-ripped cape and bloody hands. The red man creates a ring around him and whips it into the class, throwing all the students into disarray. Later, Sora wakes up and sees the debris and blood all over the room. As he tries to recall what happened, he sees the mutilated body of his classmate in the grasp of the red man. Sora recoils in fear as the red man approaches, thinking that he'll die. However, instead of killing him, the man thrusts a red stone into his chest, causing him to lose consciousness. After waking up in the hospital, the boy is immediately arrested by the police, who charge him with the mass murder of his classmates. Meanwhile, the news spread like wildfire in Japan, causing social unrest. As he is being cuffed, a man named Tamaki hands his card to the boy, saying he is a public defender. While the police escort him, Sora tries to tell them that it was all orchestrated by the Red Man. Remembering being shot in the chest, he tries to show them his wound, but is surprised when he can't find it. Seeing him overwhelmed, the attorney assures him that he'll do everything to help him. However, after a hearing in court, he is found guilty and sentenced to death. Refusing his unfair predicament, he resists arrest, only to be beaten up by Mimi's father. Just then, a video of him confessing his crimes to his lawyer plays, further implicating him. The boy begs his lawyer to deny the leaked video as it was staged, but the man refuses, saying he won't be getting any appeals, leaving the boy crying in court. Meanwhile, a mysterious white-haired girl is atop an amusement park, singing while seemingly waiting for Sora's arrival. The prison transport arrives at the Dead Man Wonderland. The prison was created 10 years ago after the former Tokyo was destroyed by a gravitational collapse known as the Dead Hole. It serves as a tourist attraction to aid in the country's recovery and is the only privately owned prison on the land. At the lineup of new inmates, the guard's captain, Makina, walks in and briefs the inmates about the prison. She tells them that the facility is a private business operating under its own rules. It combines jail and prison and earns money by casting the prisoners in shows and attractions. She also informs them that the bags they received contain their necessities and that their collars are equipped with RFID tags, tasers, and GPS transmitters. As she continues, another inmate suddenly bumps into Sora and swiftly steals from him. However, Makina spots this and disciplines the inmate by slashing him across his chest, proving how ruthless she is. In a meeting with Sora's lawyer, Makina reveals that Sora will die in a planned accident even before his execution. Meanwhile, Sora is at the prison's worksite when he suddenly recalls his dead classmates and the traumatizing ordeal he went through. As he wishes to die, the white-haired girl jumps down, resembling Mimi. She tries to hit him with a metal rod, pointing out that he doesn't want to die yet as he's evading her attacks. Trying to offer comfort, she introduces herself as Shiro and befriends him. While the two of them are talking, three other inmates step up to them, trying to bully the boy for slaughtering all of his friends. Seeing the boy getting distressed, the girl beats up the inmate. However, one of them smacks the girl with a shovel, knocking her out. Sora confronts the man, but gets beaten up instead. Meanwhile, Tamaki looks at Sora's profile, thinking that the boy witnessed the wretched egg's branch of sin and survived, which might not last long. Back at the working area, the prisoners continue to attack Sora when suddenly the beam above him explodes, causing the big red ball to start falling. Determined to prove his innocence and get his revenge against the red man, Sora expresses a strong desire to live that activates the crimson crystal inside of him. He then manipulates his blood and unleashes a barrier that obliterates the ball into pieces. Meanwhile, inside the facility, a death row inmate has taken someone hostage and demands an antidote candy to survive. However, Makina left him to die, as he had just a few seconds left to live. After a few seconds, the man's collar injects lethal poison, rendering him lifeless on the spot. Meanwhile, Sora wakes up and looks around to see the other inmates dead. He wakes Shiro up, who seems unaffected by the incident, 
and even invites him to eat together next time. Warden Makina sits in her office watching the footage of the accident and wonders if the deadly outcome was Sora's doing. She recalls her meeting with Tamaki, who orders that if their assassination attempt with the boy fails, there will be no second attempt, as it means that his plan is a success. She reflects that the man is heartless for sacrificing three inmates for his plans. She is left to wonder what is unique about Igarashi Sora, also known as Death Row Inmate Number 5580. During a visit to the clinic for his injuries, Sora is questioned by the female doctor if he has eaten his candy, which confuses him. The doctor tells him that the candy was inside the bag he received upon his arrival at the facility and warns him to eat it immediately. As the doctor explains, the guy who bumped into him earlier intervenes, apologizing for making him lose his candy. While the two are talking, Shiro emerges from a ceiling vent, asking Sora to play with her. The two boys are caught off guard by her sudden appearance, especially when she invites Sora to join the race. Seeing his confusion, the guy on the bed explains that the girl must be referring to the dog race, adding that it is one of the shows inside the prison. Moreover, the winner will have a hundred thousand casts. Discovering that the boy hasn't read the rulebook yet, the man explains that cast is the currency inside the Wonderland that the prisoners can use to buy necessities inside, even clothes, smoke, and alcohol. If he saved up, he could also buy off years from his sentence. Hungry, he immediately decides to join the race when he hears that participants will be given bread just for entering. As he lines up to join the race, Makina reminds him to read the rulebook carefully before the competition, reiterating that Dead Man Wonderland isn't an ordinary prison. Meanwhile, the man from earlier calls Tamaki to inform him that Sora is entering the dog's race. In the racer's waiting room, Sora is surprised to see the man, who's still recovering, joining the race as well. The man introduces himself as Yo, sharing that he needs to save up cast points. Just then, an imposing man, Kuzuji, and his boys walk in. With their threatening presence, the racers start to doubt joining the competition. Familiar with the man, Yo informs Sora that the man is a two-time mixed martial arts champion. However, he lost all of his glory when he attacked an actress on a live broadcast. The man spots Sora, whom he immediately punches out of nowhere, making his men laugh. He starts instilling fear in the participants, ordering them to quit the game so he can easily win the hundred thousand casts. As he steps on Yo, he declares that he makes the rules inside the prison, so they better obey him. The man bullies Sora again, ordering him to laugh for him. To survive, the boy forcefully laughs, making the men amused. Just then, Shiro enters the room, offering Sora sweetbread that they can eat before the race. However, upon seeing him on the floor, the girl approaches him, making her accidentally step on the man's foot. Annoyed, Kuzuji attempts to hit her when Makina walks in and stops him. The warden warns him, and the man exits the room without resisting. When it's just the two of them, Sora finds a magazine saying that inmates need candy every three days to fight off the poison being injected into their bodies through the collar. One candy antidote costs 100,000 casts, so he needs to win the race to survive. As Sora takes up his position at the starting line of the race, Tamaki ensures the game's difficulties are at their highest. Upon the umpire firing the gun, the inmates start running to the first obstacle. As Sora gets to it, he is immediately cut by the swinging blades, realizing that it is all real. Another inmate gets ahead who's quickly sliced, prompting the other inmates to flee, but unfortunately slain on the spot by soldiers wearing owl costumes. Thinking that it's just all for the show, the audience is impressed by the production, praising the amusement prison for its over-the-top special effects. Sora arrives at the second obstacle, called the Bungee Lottery, where he needs to pick the right rope to land safely on the ground. Discouraged after seeing an inmate drop dead, Shiro pushes Sora, and the duo dive off the beam and land safely. When they get to the Arrow Valley, the prisoners must dodge a hail of arrows or fall into pits, where they'll get electrocuted and die. As Shiro helps Sora dodge the arrows, Kuzuji uses two of his guys as human shields to protect himself from the wave of arrows shot at him. The next obstacle course involves them jumping on balls over an acid-filled pit. As Sora slips and makes a mistake, Shiro comes to the rescue, playfully directing them to a safe landing. The duo manages to scale through some other obstacle courses and reach the final stage. Just then, the boy looks at the audience and notices that the students from his school are watching. The Game Master announces that the final battle royale is about to commence, 
and Sora comes face to face with Kuzuji. For the final game, whoever holds on to the dead man ball till the very end wins the race. The three remaining contestants start to catch the ball, but they realize that the floor panels fall off one after the other. The game master announces that whoever has the ball when there's just one board left wins. As Sora runs around with the ball, Kuzuji chases after him and corners him, saying that a death row inmate like him should not struggle to survive. Fed up with the man, Sora smacks him with the ball, declaring that starting from now on, he will live by his own rules. Holding the ball, Shiro passes it on to him before she falls onto the sharp thorns below. However, realizing that she has been protecting him all this time, the boy chooses to save Shiro instead, ending the dog race without a winner. As Sora looks at his friend, he dreads surviving tomorrow without candy. A meeting is being held to admonish Tamaki for the massacre of many prisoners after the dog race. It is then revealed that the wretched egg, or the red man Sora is searching for, is also being locked up within Dead Man Wonderland. In the prison garden, Sora and Shiro just finished eating their sweet bean bread. After Shiro runs off, Sora starts wondering if that day will be his last. In the prison cafeteria, four prisoners sit and discuss how pointless the previous day's game had been, considering many were sacrificed but no winner was announced. Overhearing their conversation, Yo wonders if the game's difficulty is because of Sora's entry. Sitting on the floor of his cell, Sora addresses a letter to Mimi's father, knowing that he will die soon because of the poison. Yo then walks in, saying that they're cellmates, and hands him candy. This makes Sora really happy, declaring that he will definitely repay his kindness. Seeing him rejoicing, Yo smiles inwardly as the boy is now in debt. He recalls Tamaki ordering him to report on the boy in exchange for cast points, wondering why the promoter is so enamored of the boy. Sora chews the candy and is surprised by how awful it tastes. Seeing his reaction, Yo invites him for a snack at the cafeteria to eat something good. While playing with toys in his office, Tamaki receives a call that the Mother Goose system is down and the Wretched Egg is now on the loose. He takes a secret elevator down to the site and orders his people to immediately work on it. As he eats ice cream with Yo, Sora reminisces about his happy memories with his friends. However, as the clock strikes noon, the crimson crystal embedded inside the boy starts glowing, causing him to fall to his knees because of the burning pain. Looking towards the clock, Sora and Yo see the Wretched Egg descending. It then stirs up an explosive tornado, killing a few prisoners and injuring Yo. Wanting to protect his friend this time, Sora activates his power and manipulates his blood, attacking the wretched egg. The red man then escapes and flies back in the direction he'd come from. Meanwhile, Tamaki rejoices as a new player enters his game, excited for how the game will unfold. Waking up in a hospital bed, Sora sees Shiro by his bedside and other injured inmates on other beds in the ward. Shiro tells him that the incident was caused by a terrorist attack. Just then, he remembers the Red Man attack and wonders how he got his powers. He overhears other prisoners who have also witnessed the Red Man and learns that the man is locked up in the G-Block. Meanwhile, Makina is briefing the other guards about Sora's strange power and decides that the boy has a weapon stored in his body. Tagging the situation as a Code Red, she ordered the immediate arrest of Sora. After authorizing immediate lockdown on the facility, she activated a Necro Macro, a robot that was last used four years ago, against a rampaging prisoner to go after Sora. The lockdown was then announced through the intercom, instructing the prisoners to stay in their respective cells until further instructions. In his office, Tamaki comments on how Makina is overdoing things again. He tells Yo that he will hold him responsible if something happens with Sora. Traumatized by the incident, the prisoner calls Sora a monster, doubting if he should continue spying. Knowing he's an important part of the game, the promoter bribes the boy with more cast cards. As the intercom calls Sora to report to the security office, he and Shiro run through the hallway, trying to sneak out during the lockdown. However, they are stopped in their tracks when the metal doors shut them in. Just then, Yo arrives and stops the two from escaping, reiterating that it will bring them trouble. Sora reveals that he's looking for the Red Man as he kills his friends, finding a way to reach G-Block. Showing the map of the place, Yo proves to him that there's no place like G-Block. However, Shiro reveals that she knows a secret passageway to the place. While Sora asks her to show him the way, Necro Macro joins the trio in the hallway. As the robot dangerously approaches them, the boys plead with Shiro to show them the secret passageway. Shiro kicks a vent, telling them that they can use it as a passageway, much to their dismay. 
As they climb up the vent, the robot fires but barely misses. As the trio falls into a dark hallway, the robot follows them in, and Shiro tells them to get into another hole. As the robot is about to attack Sora, Yo, with his fast hands, turns it off. After some time, they finally stand in front of G-Block. However, Necro Macro breaks the wall in and shoots at them. Meanwhile, at Makina's office, her men report that they lost track of the group, and the robot stops responding as well, which infuriates the warden. As Necro Macro prepares to attack once more, Shiro kicks it away, angry at Sora for seemingly not treating her as a friend. As the girl stands ranting at Sora, Necro Macro gets back up behind her and prepares to shoot. Sora shouts for her, and strings of blood suddenly obliterate the robot into pieces. As the dust settles, a man steps out of the shadows, playing with blood and says, Slice! The man walks up to the broken Necro Macro, saying that it's about time it was reactivated again. He then smashes its head. Seeing his deranged smile, Sora thinks he's the Red Man and attacks him. Wondering if Sora is the woodpecker, the guy slices himself and manipulates his blood to wound Sora. He then turns them into crimson blades, introducing himself as Crow Claws, one of the branches of Sin. Meanwhile, Tamaki is having a virtual meeting with the Wonderland patrons, who are all excited to see the new player, Woodpecker, against Crow in the game. Just then, another call came in informing him of Crow's rampage outside G-Block, making him leave his meeting. Crow calls Sora Woodpecker and goads him into having a warm-up fight before their big fight tomorrow. The boy gets a metal weapon and rushes to Crow. However, the man cuts it into pieces in just a split second. Realizing that he needs to bleed before using his power, Sora wounds himself and shoots a projectile of blood at Crow in the name of his friends that he killed. This shatters the Crow's blades, but he is able to prevent them from penetrating his chest, much to Sora and Yo's dismay. Seeing his laugh once more, the boy realizes that the man in front of him is not the Red Man. Crow then introduces himself as Senji Kiyomasa. Senji then informs him that they aren't the only dead men there are who can use the Branch of Sin. He then acetivates his Crimson Blade and charges towards Sora. Shiro wards him off, kicking him in the face and demanding that he not hurt the boy. The man is flustered by her appearance, offering her his coat. Observing him, Sora confirms that Senji isn't really the Red Man he's looking for. Just then, the two get shot with anesthetic darts by hidden masked soldiers. Angered at seeing Sora unconscious, Shiro attacks the soldiers. Later, they are all captured by Tamaki in custody. Furious at how the promoter had cleaned up all that happened at G-Block without leaving a trace, Makina makes for the director's quarters. Sora wakes up strapped to a lab when Tamaki approaches him, saying he is being examined. Seeing the man, the boy is shocked to recognize him as his lawyer. After an X-ray evaluation, Senji is deemed not fit for the fight tomorrow, which infuriates him, saying that no one messes with his fights. Meanwhile, the promoter admits to the boy that he falsified his confession video, as his job is to bring every branch of sin inside the Wonderland. Furious, Sora manipulates his blood and tries to use his blood to hurt the man. However, Tamaki uses the bed to electrocute him. He then informs him of his impending fight against the crow the next day. He tells the boy that winning fights will mean countless cast points, and he might eventually meet the person he's looking for. Moreover, he briefs Sora about tomorrow's event, the Carnival Corpse, which is the Battle of the Branch of Sin Carriers. Hailed as the Wonderland's greatest event, Tamaki shows him a recap of previous fights, all of which horrify the boy. Unsatisfied by his reaction, the man plays the video again, torturing the boy even more. Meanwhile, Makina is on her way to see the director, while Senji prepares for his fight. As Sora trembled in fear, Tamaki proceeded to demonstrate a glimpse of the consequences awaiting him in case of defeat. Meanwhile, Makina seeks entry into the director's quarters, but is obstructed by two attendants. Despite her attempts to push through, they restrain her. Inside the dimly lit office, the director lies with medical tubes connected to his body. In a dark alleyway, Shiro and Yo discuss their plan to rescue Sora. While Yo believes Sora's unique power will keep him safe, Shiro expresses doubt, emphasizing that he has been always vulnerable. As the carnival corpse officially begins, the faceless commentator welcomes unseen spectators to the event. The commentator states that the fight continues until one of the contestants is incapacitated or dead. The spotlight shifts to Sora and Senji, known as Woodpecker and Crow, respectively. As Senji uses his blood manipulation to assume a fighting stance, Sora also draws blood by biting himself. When the game commences, 
Sora retreats and ascends a tree, attempting to harness his power. After some initial struggle, he successfully activates his ability and fires at Senji. Despite Sora's repeated assaults, Senji effortlessly deflects his attacks. Getting frustrated, he manipulates a lot of his blood and shoots it away, but Crow slices it too. Sora suddenly starts feeling dizzy and cold, prompting the commentator to make fun of his inexperience. Senji then chastises him for losing so much blood without a proper strategy. After the anemia sets in, Sora gets dizzy and falls on his knees. After giving his opinion on how Sora's power works, Senji remarks that he'd need a better strategy to maximize his power use. Sitting beside Tamaki, the lady doctor remarks that he could die after losing about one and a half liters of blood. Meanwhile, back on the battlefield, the tree that Sora standing on is sliced into bits, injuring him. While Senji is beating up Sora, the doctor reads the report of Sora's medical evaluation to Tamaki, saying that the crystal inside of the boy might be the same as the crystals that appeared in the places swallowed by Red Hole. They plot to open him up to confirm if he loses the fight. While reflecting on his weakness, Sora remembers meeting Shiro as a kid, resolves to stand up, and pulls Senji's coat. As they both prepare to fight again, Sora shoots at the bell right above Senji, which the latter cuts in half, only to realize that it is a distraction. Determined to win the game and live, Sora darts in and shoots at Senji's chest, bringing the fight to a close. Meanwhile, a prisoner walks up to Yo and shares information about a girl being held in G-Block. Then, together with Shiro, he makes his way back into G-Block, relying on the girl's strength to break in. In the clinic, Sora wakes up on a hospital bed with candy in hand, which he immediately consumes. He sees his prizes and remembers Senji, who told him that he would never forget him. The boy hopes they could be friends. Just then, the Corpse Carnival post-game show is being broadcast on TV. It is a penalty game where anyone who loses in the Corpse Carnival would have a part of their body taken from them. The Lady Doctor appears and uses a machine to determine what to get out of Senji. The machine stops at the right eye, and promptly, they operate on the crow to remove one of his sources of vision. Meanwhile, Shiro breaks into the prison's control room, startling the workers there. Using a walkie-talkie, Yo tricks the monitoring room staff into cutting off power to the entire prison. With the power outage, Shiro's lullaby ceases, and she stands calmly. Despite the backup's arrival, she goes on a rampage, wrecking the control room. Meanwhile, Sora is doubled over in the toilet, retching from what he witnessed on the post-game show. Shiro stands atop the remnants of the control room, smiling and holding someone's head in her hand. With a smile, Shiro tumbles from the debris she had been standing on. Tamaki enters the control room of G-Block and scowls as his men repair the Mother Goose system. The guards stationed outside the director's room arrive to escort Shiro, ignoring Yo. Sora wonders about Shiro and Yo when his thoughts are interrupted by a commotion outside. As he steps outside, he sees a huge boy moving to eat a girl's flower. He comes to the rescue and gives his food tray to the boy. The girl thanks him for the rescue, but after eating all on Sora's tray, he still demands more, and the two run off and hide in a room around the corner. Switching on the light, Sora sees that the room is the girl's and is filled with flowers. The two then sit down and talk about the post-game show. As they reflect on how messed up the place is, the girl cries and leans on him for comfort. Knowing that she can trust him, she shows him the scars on her back, recounting that her father used to abuse her and how she had killed him using her branch of sin when her life was in danger. Yo, her older brother didn't know about her powers and believed that she was falsely accused. As she continues talking about how she doesn't want to fight in the carnival show, a slight mistake makes her dress slip downward and the two quickly pull their gazes apart. Sora suggests that they escape the facility and vows to protect her. As the two of them make a run for it, they are seen by guards, and Sora finds out his next match is against her, the hummingbird. Meanwhile, laying critically ill in bed, the director criticizes Tamaki's activities within G-Block, saying the prison isn't his dream wonderland, but a birdcage he created. At the start of the corpse carnival between Woodpecker and Hummingbird, Sora tells her he won't fight her. However, she reaches for her earrings, and suddenly, he is struck with cuts on different parts of his body right after she manipulated her blood. Almost immediately, her whole demeanor changes, and it seems like Hummingbird has become an entirely new person. Phased by her character change, Sora can't help but remain on the ground. After removing her fake facade, she mentions that his innocence is a delight for her. 
Enraged at the thought of getting fooled, Sora shoots a ball of blood at her, which she blocks. As he readies for his second attack, a voice from backstage cries out his name, stopping him in his tracks. Pulling off the helmet of the guard's armor is Yo, revealing that Hummingbird is his sister. Yo promises to get his sister out of the Wonderland and buy her prison time using the cast points he saves up. As the guards prepare to remove him from the stage, Tamaki tells them to leave him be, as the viewers are enjoying the drama. As Sora is about to expose her theatrics, she cuts him on the leg, making him fall. As she starts playing the victim again, Sora tries to attack her, but Yo comes between the two, shielding Minatsuki. In her mind, she calls both of them fools and prepares to whip them both to the bone. However, his brother reveals that he knows she's responsible for their dad's death. When he witnessed her set up, he was so upset that he thought he attacked their father, but later realized that it was her all along. He tells her she doesn't have to lie, as he knows who she really is. Yo promises to protect her, but she is enraged that he pities her. She ties him up and whips him with her blood. As Sora tries to defend Yo, she explains the kind of dubious person he is. Yet unfazed, Sora explains to her that it was all part of his sacrifice for her freedom. As she unleashes a combo of whip attacks on him, Sora keeps shooting but misses as the girl uses her brother as a shield. While discussing their mother, she recounts how she was abandoned during the Red Hole incident while her mother attempted to save her, only to be crushed by falling pillars. Amidst the chaos, one of Sora's shots ricochets off the walls, causing her to lose her balance and freeing Yo. Taking advantage of the opportunity, she restrains Sora's hands to prevent him from using his powers, but he retaliates by headbutting her, rendering her unconscious. As the game concludes, viewers clamor for more action, urging him to eliminate the girl. Disregarding their demands, Sora defiantly gestures at them, refusing to comply. Meanwhile, satisfied with his decision, the director praises Sora for the ending he chose. He then approaches Shiro and attempts to rouse her, urging her to fulfill his wish. The old man tells Shiro that he left some pudding for her. Sounding uncharacteristically curt, she says she isn't the one who likes sweets. He rips something off his chest and uses the wound to control his blood like other dead men. Looking much more powerful than before, he begins their fight, and the two wreak havoc in the room. After the match, Sora apologizes to Yo, who's looking over his fallen sister. Suddenly the entire room began to shake hard, destroying the different fixtures around them. Minatsuki's bed rolls over to a glass cabinet, placing her right under falling shards of glass. She wakes up and is reminded of when her mother abandoned her in a collapsing shed. Her brother found her then, and he protected her now as well. She reluctantly picks the shards out of his arm, and he promises to never leave her. As she's still guilty of killing their father, he says he's just as responsible, adding that she didn't know about her power then. While watching them, Sora feels a strange pain inside, and is reminded of a faint memory from his childhood. The image becomes more vivid, and he realizes that his childhood friend was Shiro all along. Meanwhile, the girl ends her battle with the old man. She hears a lullaby, and guesses that the Mother Goose system must have been started. In front of her is the Red Man, whose body is revealed to be completely mechanical. She wears his mask and equipment, and the old man says that she's the wretched egg. With this, the girl lets out a devious smile. The prison is in shambles, with the guards trying to fix whatever is broken. Sora is pushed back and runs into Senji, who shares that he enjoyed his game earlier, not expecting him to beat Minatsuki. The boy suddenly apologizes, blaming himself for his lost eye. His former opponent simply laughs, assuring him that it's a common occurrence in their block. He then advises him to learn more techniques, as he's too reliant on the Sora gun, a name the young man picked for his sin. Hearing this, the newbie bashfully asks for a better name, something along the lines of superhero moves he watched before. Just then, they see Yo being driven out of his sister's room for trying to help her take a shower. She throws a flower pot, but it hits Senji's head instead. Later, Sora asks his cellmate about Shiro, who he shares used to be his childhood friend. One time, she complained about being hurt by injections, so he tried to comfort her with an Ace Man toy. This led to an argument, and the boy walked outside feeling bad. There, he was chased by an odd-looking dog, and he desperately cried out for his superhero. Fortunately, Shiro jumped out of a higher floor's window, landing right on the dog with a pose and declaring Ace Man's arrival. Seeing how attached he is to the girl, Yo cannot bring himself to share what he saw. Makina is informed, 
that the promoter has put a tight security wall on all sensitive files concerning the facility. However, the warden knows that whatever happened was a red hole, the same gravitational disaster from a decade ago. Something is wrong, and it's their duty to correct it. Meanwhile, Takashima is reporting about the boy's test results. The red crystal in his chest is actually a capsule aggregation of the nameless worm. They have some remnants of the red hole from 10 years ago, and it seems like inserting them in a body causes infection. Currently, they are unable to produce strong dead men at will, as they do not have access to the wretched egg's infected cells. Annoyed by how strict everything is, the promoter says that the director is going to be gone soon, and he'll be free to do everything he wants then. Sora runs to Minatsuki, worried about the penalty game she'll face soon. She thinks little of it, and shares that her brother also ran off to look for the officer who took his cast card. The boy quickly follows, but a dead man unexpectedly hits him in the gut, saying she thought he'd dodge. Yo sneaks around the lockers and runs into the tamaki. A monk-looking man appears behind him. The promoter tells him that prison terms aren't something he can buy in the G-block. As they casually talk about his sister's penalty game, the brother charges at them. Gaku the monk blasts him with a powerful wind gun and leaves to do his duties. Sora regains consciousness, and the girl who hit him before apologizes, explaining that she just wanted to test him. She's Kana, a member of the Scar Chain. A man appears and introduces himself as Nagi, the leader of the anti-establishment organization. Their enemy is Dead Man Wonderland itself, as well as its top leaders. She says they want to recruit him, and that she recommended his invitation after watching his match yesterday. He's glad to have found people who share the same ideals as him, but he says he's in a rush to stop the penalty game from happening. Acknowledging his innocence, the leader, codename Owl, takes out a radio. The penalty game commences, and Minatsuki is fiestier than usual, as she hoped that the boys would pull something off. The machine stops and shows that her hair was chosen to be cut off. Nagi ends his call, saying he prefers girls with short hair. This serves as a testament to what the organization can do. Just then, Gaku appears in the hideout, throwing a beaten Yo in and shooting everything with his gun. Sora fights back, but is immediately dealt with. The monk takes an electric guitar out and begins to chant. Sora's sin is ineffective against the monk, who suddenly takes out an electric guitar and aims the top at him. As he's about to play and shoot, Shiro drops from the vent, breaking the instrument in half. With a flashy entrance, she's back to her playful self and calls on her childhood friend to eat pudding. Quickly accepting the situation, Gaku retreats for now. As they recover from the unexpected attack, a young man named Roku returns, saying he has finally made some progress. As he asks who the strangers are, Shiro and Sora talk about pudding, as if nothing had happened. A while later, Nagi gathers all their members, and the new recruit introduces himself to them. The others are friendly, but begin to question why his companions are in the block, despite not being dead men. Roku tells them to quiet down, otherwise they make him miscalculate. The leader says he's the head of their intelligence gathering, and was the one who saved Minatsuki from the penalty game. While they might not completely agree with bringing the boy in, the environment is friendly and full of trust. The newcomers are given something to eat, and the questions about their origins resume. Shiro says she's always there. Sora thinks they're lax for an anti-system organization, so the leader asks what kind of freedom he wants. In their locker room, the officers talk about the upcoming safety inspection. Makina says that the promoter will be too busy handling the inspectors. If they don't obtain the hidden documents now, their future will be in chaos. Meanwhile, the group Scar Chain is planning to strike in a week, when Dead Man Wonderland is busy pretending to be a pure prison. They're planning a mass jailbreak, and the concern then is whether or not to distract the Undertakers, an anti-Dead Man force, led by Tamaki. The boy recalls how his attack was easily deflected, but Roku makes a fool of him, playing a video of Gaku simply dodged his attack. He brands him as an unreliable child, and the others chortle at the mocks. Frustrated, the newbie decides against joining them, and walks away with Shiro. In a lab's ruins, Tamaki plays bowling with the dead director's head, celebrating his rise to the throne. Meanwhile, Sora asks Senji about Undertakers, and the possibility of their sins not working on them. Hearing that he fought against an Undertaker, the fellow dead man complains, and says to call him the next time he encounters one. He's told that Nagi was there as well, so he shares that his girl was killed by an Undertaker a couple of years ago. He was forced to fight against his wife during the Carnival Corpse, and had his neck slit for losing. 
They deemed that he lost on purpose, so they sentenced his wife to a penalty as well. The couple tried to run away, but it only ended with the woman being killed by Gaku. He returns to his room and finds Nagi playing with Shiro. He immediately apologizes for calling them carefree and shares that he heard about his wife. The leader says that they might act that way, but they're all scared of what's to come. They don't seek revenge, but freedom with the disassembly of Dead Man Wonderland. For their individual and collective purposes, there is no room to shake in fear. However, unlike them, who keep their desire for revenge at bay, he trembles in anger at the thought of the Red Man. He asks Shiro if she wants something, and she says that she wants the big Ferris wheel outside. It's reserved for the prison's customers, but he gets an idea and promises to ride it with her soon. At a lounge, Gaku thinks about his broken guitar and receives a new one right away. Someone makes a report about their plans, who's revealed to be Roku. The Red Hole incident took away the entire city of Tokyo, and Dead Man Wonderland was eventually built, around the area where the phenomenon occurred. The announcer reports the upcoming inspection of the facility, as well as the ceremony for those lost during the incident. Watching the report, the members of Scar Chain talk lightly about their fight for freedom, when Sora suddenly appears. He apologizes for what he said, and asks to join the organization. The boy sees that Shiro followed him, and tells her to return to the room. She refuses, saying she wants to be with him. As he declines the members' congratulations and jealousy, he reminds the girl of their promise to ride the Ferris wheel. She turns away with a glum look, but it doesn't last long, as Kana says that he only wants to keep her safe. The operation's aim isn't just a jailbreak, but an exposition of how abusive the prison is. Nagi raises a drive, containing records of the facility's illegal operations, conclusive enough to disassemble the facility. They go through the plan again and put their arms together, determined to be free from the chains of prison. As they begin, warnings pop up on the prison guard's screens, and they immediately ask for the Undertaker's help. Nagi and Roku successfully infiltrated the control room. Meanwhile, Sora's group passes through locked doors, but fails to do so with no issues. A Necromacro detects their presence and douses them with acid. A single member is hit, and his flesh begins to melt. The machine hits the bridge's beams, and Kana tosses the drive to Sora, sacrificing herself to keep the bridge up until they pass. He tries to turn back, but the others pull him forward, keeping their eyes on the mission. Back then, the members questioned the decision to assign a chaotic girl to be an associate leader. While the others mocked her, Nagi appeared and complimented the sound of her necklace. It might just be an ordinary bell, but hearing it in a dire situation would tell him that there's a comrade nearby. When he saw her during the carnival corpse, he realized that she wasn't just a good fighter and asked her to be an associate leader. His shallow reasoning gets a laugh out of her. Looking up, she wonders if everyone has crossed safely and envelops her body in blood as the Necro Macro releases another burst of acid. She emerges unscathed and pounds the machine open, sending it over the bridge. Sora feels bad for leaving her behind, but the others remind him of the responsibility that she passed on. They might still have a chance, as they're nearing the exit, without even having run into any undertakers. Now they have to wait and see if Nagi successfully takes over the control room. The battle ends, and the two are about to access the service elevator for the team, when a little girl suddenly walks into the room. The leader obliviously promises to take care of her, and tells Roku to activate the elevator. However, he disobeys, and the girl takes out a huge weapon from the bag on her back. She introduces herself as Himari, the third squad leader of the Undertakers. Now understanding the situation, Nagi fights back, but his branch of sin melts upon getting close to her weapon, and he's smacked across the room. Realizing that Sora was telling the truth, he figures out that his trusted information leader was a traitor. She then explains that her weapon is a worm eater, which turns dead men's blood back into normal upon contact. With the full weight of the operation on his shoulders, he summons more orbs from his wounds, but they're all useless in the face of the girl's weapon. The others begin to worry, and their leader is barely keeping himself alive against his opponent. She refuses to stop punishing him, waiting for him to apologize for his actions. Himari suggests a Ling Chi, an execution method from way back, where a criminal's body parts are sliced on by one. With that in mind, she begins slicing her way through his body, taking away his flesh piece by piece, and she says that pain helps educate bright minds, something her mother made sure she understood. He finally recalls the mutilation case at a preschool, and says that a fine lady would never act like her. 
With his continuous insults, her eyes grow dark, and she lashes out at the man. She thinks about all the times she made mistakes as a child, and how her mother punished her mercilessly. The blade cuts through his arm, but he simply rips it off and throws it at the child, using it as a distraction to activate the elevator for his members. He falls from the fight, but the others are finally able to ascend, just according to plan. On their way, they talk about the freedom that's within their grasp. However, they reach the top and are met with gunshots from Gaku. They fight back, but their powers don't work, and they're all quickly subdued. Roku is impressed, as the leader of Scar Chain overcame his low odds of winning. The probability of their planned success is even lower, but they refuse to give up hope. The traitor says that it's his job to make sure they lose, and he questions why the promoter ever puts up with his ridiculous plans and operations. Now, they're finally about to start. Kosugi slaps Sora back to his senses and tells him to protect the drive no matter what happens, as it's their only hope. Just then, a prison guard jumps down to attack them. The man takes him out, but at the expense of his own life. He leaves things to the boy, who then begins to feel the weight of all those who place their trust in him. With his resolve stronger, he stands and runs. Meanwhile, Nagi is left alone and is able to take the radio out of his tooth. He sends a desperate cry for help, which rings throughout their hideout. Shiro, who was walking away from the loud sirens, passes by the hideout, where she sees an unfamiliar boy looking around. Sora encounters Gaku and strikes, but the man simply deflects his attacks and talks about a hidden Ace Man finale, where the hero succumbed to a surprise attack by his own people. He aims his gun at the boy, but someone stops him before he can shoot. Not arguing, he steps back and retreats to the elevator. The rebels want to continue their operation, but Shiro suddenly appears and snatches the drive out of her friend's hands. She throws it into a room and shuts the doors tight. A huge explosion comes from inside, and the girl's back is burned from the heat of the door. That said, she's relieved that she made it in time, and asks Sora if he's okay. Sora looks on, and so do the others, horrified over what she just did. Seeing how she destroyed the key to their plan, they suspect her of being a traitor. Confused, she says she only did it, because it was dangerous for the boy to keep holding it. He cries out, saying this is the reason why he wanted her to stay behind. However, he falls silent as she argues that she only did it because he's too weak to protect himself. The two get into a scuffle, and he hits Shiro, telling her to never show him her face again. Forced to abandon the operation, they return to the hideout, having experienced drastic casualties. To their relief, Kana appears, and they relay the recent events that transpired. Only a handful of people are left in the organization, but they still have time to make things work, as the inspection committee hasn't gone home yet. They're willing to try again, but they've lost both the data drive and Roku. While that's true, they themselves can become evidence and spread the word about their experiences when they escape. She encourages them to continue the operation, and they call on her to be the next leader. The woman declines, certain that Gaku left Nagi alive for his own enjoyment. For now, she vows to put her life on the line, however many times she has to. As expected, the monk is toying with the organization leader, even offering him a spot among the Undertakers. Meanwhile, Makina and Kasuga successfully infiltrate the promoter's computer and plan to wring him dry until the inspectors leave. Looking through the data, she sees a register of the prisoners, along with a list of compatible subjects. They hide as the doors suddenly open. Tamaki shows Aohai from the Ministry of Defense around his office, and they talk about the nameless worms manufacturing process. As they talk about the logistics of the experiments, Makina realizes what's happening. On the other hand, Sora is still mad at Shiro, who called him weak after destroying their plan. Wondering why the Undertakers haven't gone after them, despite knowing where they are, they talk about getting someone powerful to work with them. They throw a few options around and reach a boy codenamed Mockingbird. They get excited at the strong prospect, but they haven't seen him lately. Sora tries to volunteer himself, promising to work hard, but Kana cannot accept it. He was unable to fight against the Undertakers, and now they have no room for failure. The boy turns bitter as he's scolded for blaming their failure on Shiro. Just then, Roku appears and furiously bangs on the door, demanding to know who destroyed the drive after realizing that it was a bomb. The others don't understand, so he reveals that there was no data on it at all, owning his plan of blowing them all up. With this, Sora realizes what his friend did. Meanwhile, 
Nagi rejects the idea of joining the Undertakers. Gaku admits that they might be a crazy group, but the leader of the rebel group is the craziest among them all. As he shouts in fury, a hallucinogen spreads throughout his body, and his vision blurs. The Undertakers suddenly swarm the hideout, planning to kill them one by one, until Nagi changes his decision. Meanwhile, Shiro still feels bad, and goes to the lab looking for the director, unaware that he's already dead. She opens the old can of cookies she received, but is left alone while waiting for Sora to return. The girl eats them all, but tears run down her cheeks. In the hideout, Roku has lost control, and proudly reveals that he forged the video that convicted the boy of a death sentence. He calls on Mozuri and Shinagawa, a crazed pair who were chosen to be their executioners. The boy calls for Shiro, but the one who saves him is Senji, who cuts the Undertakers down with no problem. He fights against the guards as well, and encounters the anti-dead man weapons they're so proud of. Understanding how it works, he uses a different approach, and the guards are all suddenly cut up, without even touching his blood. The fighter finds them boring, and explains that his ultrasonic blade can penetrate through their armor with air pressure. While they look at him in awe, Shiro is still sulking in the lab. There she sees the same boy who informed her about the drive, so she complains about being hit despite saving everyone. The strange boy introduces himself as Toto, the Mockingbird, and tries to cheer Shiro up, swearing that he has no plan to hurt her. Gaku is still injecting substances into Nagi, trying to have him accept their invitation, but the leader's resolve is unwavering. The Undertaker reminds him about how he came bursting into their base after his wife died and killed 22 of their apprentices. The hallucinogens begin working as he recalls the memory that shouldn't have been there. Seeing the unfamiliar images, his mind gets corrupted. With Senji's arrival, the situation at the hideout is quickly settled. Sora whines about how terribly he acted, so Kana says that it's natural for those in prison. With this, she invites Senji to their cause, but he finds them ridiculous, and says that the weak shouldn't bear their teeth in the first place. Sora finds himself pathetic, and runs through the halls to meet Senji. He asks for lessons on how to fight, desperate to beat the weakness out of him and become stronger. The seasoned fighter accepts his request with respect, but warns him that it won't be easy at all. Stealing his resolve, he activates his own sin, and the two clash. Toto teases Shiro for eating all day, and asks why she's so upset over getting hit. She says she's Ace Man, and that she isn't supposed to get hurt. However, the pain simply won't stop whenever she thinks about Sora hating her so much. She eats to feel better, but stuffing her face doesn't work. The boy questions why she cares so much about a weak human who's so sly and betrayed her after she saved him. Annoyed, the girl insists that she doesn't care about him and storms off to punch her friend in revenge. Left alone, Toto takes some of the sweets she was eating. The mission to rescue Nagi is postponed, as the resources they have aren't enough. They'll use guerrilla tactics to find their own way out, separately. There aren't any safe routes anymore, so whatever happens, happens. Kana says they'll do it with the present party, leaving Sora behind and accepting the resentment that'll come from him. As they head out, Roku says they're basically throwing their lives away. Wearing a guard's uniform, she walks out and thinks of the time when Nagi showed her a locket of his child, whom he loved so much. However, she was shocked to see that it was empty and just humored him with understanding. Senji is training Sora hard, but the boy just doesn't get it. As a drastic measure, he takes away his candies and crushes all but one. He tells him to defend against his sonic blade and that he'll be executed in three days if he isn't fast enough. They resume training and Toto suddenly appears, asking if they've seen Shiro. He greets Senji, apologizing for being gone for a while. They clash for just a second and it quickly ends in the boisterous man's defeat. He finally introduces him to Sora, the strongest dead man there is. However, he says that many things happened and claims to have become the weakest instead. The older dead man drives him away from the boy, saying that they're undergoing special training. As such, he shakes his hand and runs off. Tamaki calls Gaku and asks him to finish his work soon, as he needs a new toy to play with. He assures the new director that things are going well, and looks at Nagi, whose spirit has been completely broken. The remaining members of Scar Chain proceed with their plan. Shiro drops from a vent as usual, and falls unconscious in the arms of a guard. Gaku appears and kicks the guard's helmet off, exposing Kana's disguise. Meanwhile, the special training is put to an end, as Sora has shot out too much blood. 
Unwilling to give up, he uses whatever is left and launches a small bullet. He's worried that it's too small, but the attack suddenly speeds up, shattering the candy into pieces. Just then, the monk appears on the screens and shows that Kana and Shiro have been captured. Seeing this, Sora runs off to save his friends, while the members of Scar Chain drop their heads, feeling sorry for their stubborn leader. The boy realizes that he's been left behind and runs into guards who easily subdue him. However, a whip of blood, faster than sound, takes them all out. Minatsuki appears to settle her debt and directs him to the Undertaker's base. She declines the invitation to join, saying she has an older brother to take care of. He accepts, but promises to free her eventually nonetheless. Meanwhile, the rebel organization is struggling to fight back and is desperate to survive. Sora finally finds his friends and focuses on controlling his blood flow like earlier. Just like that, he shoots through the guard's anti-dead man armor, but barely keeps himself standing. Shiro runs to him, but Himari swings at her legs, sending her flying to the wall. The boy crawls to her, and the undertakers find them pathetic and pitiful. Gaku begins playing his guitar, and the doors behind him open to reveal Nagi. Kana runs to him, but he stops her, saying he's gotten much saner than before. Since then, he's regained his memories, and is well aware that he slaughtered the undertakers after his wife and child were killed by the monk. Tamaki feigned pity when he came to him. He opened the door to a lab and showed the father his baby, a fetus submerged in a big capsule. Nagi's eyes have become much more sinister since they all last met, and they can do nothing but tremble. As he weeps and curses everyone with despair, he lets his sin out, conjuring several balls of blood around them. Saying he was too weak to protect anyone, he detonates the balls, bombing the entire room. Gaku goads him further, saying he could be the demon of his dreams and telling him to kill them all. The man, blinded by rage, screams in anguish, readies the second wave of explosions. Ayohai commends Tamaki for getting through the inspection and successfully showing off Dead Man Wonderland's best parts. For better or worse, the prison is but a miniature version of the world, and he, as the promoter, is simply giving the prisoners a dream to pursue. Nagi detonates several of his blood bombs, indiscriminately hitting the people in the room. Sora crawls over to Kana, who's crying from having failed to protect their leader from the cruel world. He was too weak, so all he could do was keep quiet or go completely insane. The crazed man approaches Shiro, but the boy puts himself between them, taking all the blows for himself. She desperately tells him to stop, saying she still won't forgive him and begging him to run away. He falls multiple times, but he continues to get up. They all call out to Nagi, reminding him of his kindness and ideals. However, without his loved ones, all he sees is darkness. The boy says he might not understand his pain, but he's well aware of the loneliness, of knowing that the dead won't ever come back. Even then, there's still light around them, and they just have to open their eyes. Just then, he hears the bell on Kana's necklace. Sora has realized what's important to him, so he puts himself in front of Shiro and vows to protect his friend in light. However, he falls and realizes that he hasn't taken the antidote candy. Their words finally reach the leader, and he's brought back with a strong slap from Kana. The guilt of what he's done sets in, so she hugs him tight, saying he can make up for it later. A blade pierces her chest, and she immediately falls to the ground. They desperately call out to her, but she remains unmoving. Enraged, Sora aims his palm at Gaku and shoots two blood bullets out, not caring about the consequences. Unfortunately, it's ineffective, and the Undertaker stops it with a single hand. Kana coughs and seals her wound with her sin. He tries to corrupt Nagi's heart again, but it doesn't work anymore. The rebel leader says that salvation is not in death, but in the people who experience life with them. Displeased with how his toy has lost its function, Gaku transforms his guitar into a gun and shoots a hole right through the man's gut. Taking things into his own hands, the monk shoots everyone there, even hitting Himari as he laughs maniacally. The monk once nursed an abandoned cat in the past, when peers began to beat him mercilessly. At the temple, the head priest simply scolded him for getting into a fight, lecturing him about evil. He says he bears them no hatred, and asks if there's a way to save mankind from pain and grant them spiritual enlightenment. On a random day, the Red Hole incident hit, and their entire village was left in a wreck. The cat he took care of was buried in rubble, and he questioned why the Buddha would deem suffering to be necessary. 
Later on, the priest walks around to check on survivors, but sees the horrific sight of Gaku, cutting down his peers and nailing them to the wall. The boy said that he figured out how to save everyone and had a crazed smile on his face, a smile that persisted until his adulthood. Behind him is the statue of Buddha, and he says that salvation is granted by death alone. The poison from the collar seeps into Sora's body, and the monk approaches them with sinister intent. Himari has escaped from the site, not wanting to be part of it anymore, but she encounters Toto. He immediately takes her out, using the same sonic technique as Senji, and walks away while complaining about his fragile body. Sora feels bad for not being able to save anyone, and the red crystal in his chest began to glow. As the Undertaker aims, Shiro's legs react to the crystal, but her friend still puts himself in between them. Red lines mark their bodies, and he shoots a blast much more powerful than before. Gaku tries to block, but Nagi stops him and brings them the salvation he wanted. The attack puts a hole in the building, and the leader calls for Sora, giving him candy to eat. He thanks Kana for all she's done, and feels her warm tears fall on his face. Shiro regains consciousness, and her friend finally apologizes for hitting her and saying horrible things. Despite their win, he can't help but feel bitterness for all the sacrifices they made. The next day, Tamika receives news of the entire incident. Makina reports that all her prisoners are accounted for, but she adds that Sora and Yo returned with serious injuries. As such, she says she'll be conducting a thorough investigation, and the new director tells her to do what she sees fit. Outside, Kasuga says that she's chosen the most suitable personnel from the general prisoners on the promoter's list. The warden says it's time to lay the trap. Meanwhile, Toto is with the twins and is curiously looking at Sora's old photo with Shiro. With a sinister smile, he wonders what the boy's sin would taste like. Up on a building, Shiro sings a familiar song, saying Sora's mother made it. While he's fond of it, he asks her to stop singing, as the red man was singing the song on the day he slaughtered his class. That said, he can't understand how he knew the song. 